Hello and welcome to another episode of the Anxiety Rx podcast. Today, I want to talk about something that's growing more and more into my awareness. It's this inability to receive. I've talked about this before on the podcast, this inability to receive, specifically inability to receive love. Because I'm noticing how much of this is actually part of my psyche. And I'm really noticing it now because I I visit my mother who's 90 and she calls me just about every day. Well, she calls me, she does call me every day and say, I'm lonely. Can you come and visit me? Because I'm really lonely. And then I'll get there and I'm there for about 10 or 15 minutes. And she's like, well, you can, you can go now. You know, it's like, you know, so it just, it dumbfounds me because she's so upset when she calls me or emails me or texts me, she can still, she's 90, but she can still use the freaking computer and her iPad. But when I get there, once I'm there, she's not that willing to connect with me. And I think this, this hurts me in a way because I see parallels of this in my own life. Like I see parallels of me wanting connection and then pushing it away time and time and time again. Again, there's a reason why I've been married three times. And I'm starting to see that I have this avoidant attachment style. Now, I've known this for a long time. But my mother is, as she gets older and as she gets more frail, this avoidant attachment style becomes more and more glaring. Like I see it more and more. And I also realize, how how do I have this exact, how do I have this exact same thing? Because when we see something in someone else that really bothers us, chances are we've got the same thing going on. And I know that I do. And I know I've always had this kind of avoidant attachment style in that I am very interested in connection. But then when the connection's there, I start going, well, this is too much for me. Like my friend, Dr. Nima, talks about this, about this this back and forth between feeling abandoned and wanting to assuage that feeling of being abandoned and then being engulfed, being taken over. So it's this back and forth. And I think Dr. Nima is really onto something with this engulfment, abandonment kind of back and forth. Because I see it in myself. I see it in my mother. I see it in so many people that we want attention. We want connection. We're afraid of it at the same time, which of course is going to create a tremendous amount of anxiety. And I'm talking to Cynthia about this and I'm talking to Nima about this too. It's like, do you find me difficult to, to connect with? And they will say sometimes, and then I will say to them, do you find that I have a hard time expressing what I need? And they will both say, yes, absolutely. Without a doubt, that is true. So I'm really realizing how I go through the world in this way that I don't express my own needs. And in fact, I'm a a real caregiver. Like if you get on the phone with me, and this is the reason why I became a doctor, I will help you. I will help you to the ends of the earth. And I will direct the conversation to your problems. I won't allow it to come into my problem. Now, I'm just seeing a a lot more of this in the last probably two or three months, because in the last two or three months, the book is doing really well. It's sold like 70,000 copies. A major publisher is now picking it up. So it'll be in wide distribution next year. My MBRX program is doing extremely well as well. There's 2,000 people in there. And I'm noticing that for the first two or three weeks of this success of the program, I was on top of the world, probably happier than I've been maybe my whole life. And then over the course of the last three months or so, I noticed that that desire to look at the negative has become more and more part of my psyche. And just realizing the resistance that I have, not so much the success, and I don't think it's imposter syndrome, although I think there's probably a bit of that in there, but I feel pretty confident in what I know and what I share is valuable. But there is this resistance to connection. And if you look at our social engagement system, if you look at this part of our brain and our body that's designed to connect to other people, eye contact, tone of voice, prosody of voice, body language, facial expression, this software that's in us 
is designed to make us feel safe. When we are connected to someone else, when we're making eye contact, when we feel felt, as Daniel Siegel says, when we feel connected to other people, there is this sense of safety. Now, the problem with anxiety and alarm is it shuts off our social engagement system because it sees our social engagement system as kind of secondary. Our brains are designed for survival and procreation. They are not designed to make us happy. So when we go into survival mode, it shuts down that social engagement system, that ability to feel loved, feel connected, feel safe. So we get double whammied. On one hand, we f- we're already feeling alarmed. And on the other hand, the software that we need to soothe that alarm, to feel connected to other people and ourselves, is offline. So if your social engagement system is offline, you can't soothe yourself. And you may be able to soothe other people, because I'm very practiced at this, even when I'm alarmed myself, even as a doctor, when I was in deep, deep anxiety and alarm, I could still help other people. But there was this sense of disconnection, like I wasn't really connecting with people. I was going through the motions in a way of being a doctor, which is one of the reasons why I left medicine, was I really felt that I couldn't really connect with people because I only had seven to 10 minutes, excuse me, with each person. And that doesn't allow you really to make a connection. I mean, I, I made as good a connection as I could make, but there was a real frustration there. And I also realized that in that role as a doctor, I could feel secure because it was a role. It wasn't really me. It wasn't really me connecting with another human being. It was me as a doctor performing my doctor duties. So it gave me the illusion of connection, but there wasn't really a whole lot of connection there. So I notice when I go see my mother now, just how much she cannot receive and how that really affects her, how that makes her more anxious, how that makes her more unable to eat. She goes through these phases where she won't eat for two days because she's so anxious. And a lot of it is because she's lonely. A lot of it is because she has cut off this ability to connect with other people. And I notice more and more how I do that, how I look at the world as kind of an unsafe place. This isn't conscious. This is unconscious. This is a program that was put into me, probably put into my mother, probably put into her mother before her, and we are just acting it out. I am just acting out this program that doesn't allow me to feel connected, this inability to receive love. Now, this the short version of this, and I mentioned this before, is that my father was schizophrenic and bipolar, so I loved him very much, but when he would go off the rails, I would lose that connection with him. So after a while, I thought, well, it's not safe to love this guy because he's just going to go crazy and then I'm going to lose him, so it's not safe to love. So that's where a lot of this comes from with me. It's not safe to love. And if it's not safe to love, life loses a lot of its meaning. We start searching for things externally. When we can't give that internal connection and love to ourselves, we start looking for it externally. There's a huge part of me that loves external gratification. I love getting your messages that say the books changed your life or the programs changed your life. I love messages like that. But there's a lot inside of me that just doesn't allow that in. And when I don't allow it in, I just feel this pervasive sense of loneliness. And I'm realizing that I have this real inability to receive. So when I talk to my friend Nima and I talk to my wife and I ask them, do you find that I express my needs, what I need? And they both say no, because I don't. And I'm wondering how pervasive that is in we anxious people that we don't express our needs. Because I think as children, we couldn't express our needs because there was too much crap going on in our household. So we became small. We didn't express our needs. We learned how to be people pleasers, how to be helpers. And that's how we got that external validation, that external gratification, rather than getting it from inside. And when you don't get it from inside, eventually you'll start showing up with anxiety, depression, eating disorders, OCD, personality disorders. All these things will show up if you don't get the attuned, attached connection you needed as a child. And, and also what I'm seeing in myself is this sense of anhedonia, 
things are actually going really well for me right now, but I'm having a hard time feeling a lot of pleasure or joy in life. And I'm wondering, like when I wake up in the morning, why aren't I just jumping out of bed elated because things are good, you know, money's coming in, I'm doing well, the book is doing really well, like why am I looking at the negative side of things? And I realize as a child, things would go okay, I would have my dad, he would be great, and then all of a sudden it would just collapse because he would, he would collapse into psychosis or depression or mania. And I realized that I have this program in me that says, don't get too happy because this is all going to get taken away. And I unconsciously act from that program. And I notice how that pervades my entire approach to the world is that if you're always waiting for the other shoe to drop, which a lot of we worriers are, you never actually get to see what you truly want because you're too busy being overwhelmed by what you don't want. And we constantly give ourselves what we don't want in worrying. When you worry, you're constantly giving yourself what you don't want. I, don't, I hope this doesn't happen. I hope I don't get cancer. I hope, I, I hope my marriage lasts. All these things, all these things form this kind of milieu that we live in. And when you're always pushing away the negative, and actually, we're not even actually pushing it away. We're actually bringing it in to ourselves, this negative. There's no room to see what you want. And I'm noticing that. It's like, I'll ask myself, what do you want? And I'm having a really hard time answering that question because I'm so used to being consciously and unconsciously focused on what I don't want. And one of the laws of neuroscience is, Whatever you focus on, consciously or unconsciously, you'll get more of that. And I just notice that because I'm focused on the negative, because I'm focused on, oh my God, I hope this doesn't happen, all the things that could potentially happen that are negative become more apparent. I pay, my brain pays more attention to the potential negative than it does the potential positive. And if my brain is always busy with the negative, avoiding the negative, there's no room for the positive to come in. So asking myself, what do I want, is an impossible question because I'm living with this energy of what I don't want all the time. So there's no room to see actually what I want. I mean, it's in, there's things that I get pleasure in. I love reading your comments, saying that the book is great and the program's you know, saving your life or whatever it is. I love that stuff. But I have a hard time allowing a lot of that stuff in. And just looking at the world like it's really supporting me. Because the world right now is really supporting me. Maybe for the first time. Or the first time that I'm allowing it. And I'm just pointing out to people, how much of your life is you just avoiding the negative? And we avoid the negative in a number of ways. One of the main things that we do in this society is we fall into our addictions. And it can be shopping, it can be porn, it can be gambling, it can be alcohol, it can be all these things that we use to numb ourselves because the pain of being a human being seems to be increasing. With all the traumas and dramas in the world, our safety seems to be kind of slowly being sucked away from us. And at the same time, our ability to receive connection from other people is being lost. And I think when you don't receive connection from other people, you don't really have the template to give that connection to yourself. And rather than feel the pain and connect with that younger, wounded version of yourself, we fall into our addictions. So we'll, I'm, I zombie scroll Instagram. I know after I've been sitting on Instagram for 15 or 20 minutes, it's like, what are you avoiding? And then what I will do is go, okay, I'm not going to look at Instagram. I'm going to leave my phone over there. And then I'm going to say, where do you feel that in your body? That urge to kind of soothe yourself. Because for me, it shows up in my solar plexus. Like it shows up with all my alarm. It shows up in my solar plexus. And if I can put my hand over that area and breathe into it and actually be very grateful for that signal, that sign of being connected to myself, I have the sense that I'm actually getting at the root cause of the pain that I'm feeling. 
Because all anxiety is separation anxiety, as you've probably heard me say many, many times, and it's mostly separation from yourself. So the more you connect with yourself, the less you need these external validations, the less you need your addictions, because you're actually soothing the issue at its source. But it comes back full circle in that if you have a hard time receiving love, specifically from yourself, but from other people too, and that's what soothes you, you are going to lean towards your addictions, which we are doing as a society. We are actually leaning towards our addictions because we are losing the ability to connect with each other and we're losing the ability to connect with ourselves. So what I'm telling people and what I'm trying to say in this podcast is be really aware of how you look at the world because there is that confirmation bias. If you believe consciously or unconsciously that the world is an unsafe place, You will see more of that in your external and internal environment. You will focus on where things are unsafe. Whereas if you're aware, if you become aware of, okay, I'm feeling negative right now towards, you know, my mother or my friends or whatever, where is that in me? Like what is, what is happening in me that's causing me to feel this angst, this disconnection that's shutting off my social engagement system? That's, that's not allowing me to soothe myself, that's forcing me to go and grab my phone and start zombie scrolling Instagram. What is in me that's doing that? Can I be aware of that? Because you can't change anything you're not aware of. You cannot change anything that you're not aware of. And if you have this unconscious default programming, as I do, to always expect the negative, you can't see the positive. It just doesn't come into your purview. You don't check it out. You don't see it. It's not there. And anything that is positive, you'll tend to just kind of let fade into the background. But anything that's negative because of the confirmation bias, anything that's negative lights up like a Christmas tree and anything that's positive fades into the background. And this happens a lot when our body is alarmed. When our body is alarmed, we look for danger. And as I said before, we paralyze our prefrontal cortex. So not only do we, one, look for more danger in the ways of worries and fears, but the part of our brain that would reassure us has been shut off. So we get hit twice. We make more threats and then we believe them because the part of our brain that would show us that those threats aren't accurate has been shut offline. So what is the feeling you get in your body before you reach for your phone, before you reach for a drink, before you reach for online shopping or porn or whatever it is. Like, what is the feeling in your body? And can you allow yourself to feel that and really notice what is going on? How do you feel lonely? How do you feel alarmed? What's going on in your system? And try to connect with that. You may not be able to soothe it, at least right away. But it's being able to notice it first because we can't change anything we don't see. So where does inability to receive come into your life? Where do you have a hard time receiving from your spouse or your parents or your children? Where are you forcing the conversation into their problems and avoiding your own? That's a big one for me. So the solution from my perspective is to create awareness and create some space around that discomfort. Allow it to be there. Embrace it if you can. Embrace the pain because that pain, as I've said many times, is your younger self, is your younger wounded self. I know when I feel the pain of connection that it's taking me right back to that place with my dad where he would start going crazy and I would kind of lose it. Because there was no, I was going to lose that connection and there wasn't a fucking thing I could do about it. But as an adult, there is something we can do about it. We can actually start allowing ourselves to feel that disconnection pain, that urge to dissociate. And we may not be able to catch it every time. In fact, we won't. But once we see it, once we see, hey, I'm really looking at this situation very negatively. And do I have to? Do I have to look at this negatively? This protective reflex that that I have, that maybe you have too, of looking at the negative all the time isn't really protective at all because it sucks the life out of life. So perhaps you can replace that. It's very hard to, to, to stop doing something. It's very hard to stop 
Like when I see people say, well, detox your phone, stop your phone for 24 hours. That is excruciating for those of us with, with anxiety because we've used this phone as a way of assuaging, of dissociating, of getting away from our anxiety. We distract into the phone or whatever it is. So can you be aware of that urge to go into the phone and realize that that urge is your younger self asking for your attention? It's asking to be seen, heard, and loved. And can you give it as much attention as you can, knowing that you're probably already an alarm and your ability to connect is probably a lot lower than it would be if you were feeling good? But the trick is to make the intention every day, and I'm making a meditation for this right now, of focusing on where you see the world as a negative and do you have to. I'm not saying be grateful for everything. I'm not saying always look at the positive. I'm just saying, can you be aware of how negatively you actually look at the world? Because everybody that I have ever treated for anxiety feels like a victim. Everybody that I've ever known with chronic anxiety feels like a victim, has trouble with connection. That's why they're anxious, because they can't allow it in. They can't receive that connection specifically from themselves. And that started when they were younger and they didn't get the attached, attuned connection they needed from their parents. So can you start giving yourself that attached, attuned connection now, knowing that you probably aren't going to be that good at it at, at the beginning? But knowing one of the big barriers in, in connecting with yourself is this feeling that the world is an unsafe place and you always have to be on your guard or falling into your addictions, falling into dissociation. So you're either in this alarm state or you're in this addicted, dissociated state. And neither of those states provide any sense of safety, any sense of, of warmth or connection because we're afraid of warmth and connection. So we have to take it baby steps. We have to take it slowly. We have to start connecting with ourselves. And this is what I talk about in Anxiety Rx and specifically in MBRX, how to connect with that younger version of yourself. Because anxiety, in my opinion, is a disconnection of your mind and your body and your adult self with your child self. When we bring those things back together, we start resolving the anxiety. When we come connected with ourselves, and one of the big ways of becoming connected with ourselves is to start looking at the world in a much more positive light, or at least, at the very, very least, looking at the world in a less negative light, being aware of how you look at the world through these red-colored glasses, I call them, or gray-colored glasses how that's tainting everything. And you're not even aware that you're not able to receive because you're in this state of alarm. Your social engagement system has been shut off. You're not able to connect with yourself or others, which of course just makes you feel anxious and lonely and drives you into dissociation. And we get into this, this loop of dissociation, pain, and more dissociation, pain. And it just can't get out of it. So you can't change anything you don't see. So really, in the next little while, look at how you look at the world in a negative way and see that you actually have a choice. But first, it's really, really getting the feeling of understanding that you have a defensive accommodation to look at the world as an unsafe place and all the ways you do that automatically without even thinking about it. And once you see it, then you don't have to be it anymore. So I would really look at how you see the world. And this was a revelation for me is how negatively, even though things are going well for me now, how negatively I still look at the world and how I will never find what I want when I'm always focused on what I don't want, what I'm always afraid of. I'll never find what... What nourishes me if I'm always focused on what I'm afraid of? So thanks for listening to me this week. It's been a really difficult podcast to record. I've done this four times now, and this time I think it will actually work. So I apologize if it's a bit fractured, 
But this is really up for me right now. This, this inability to really see the world as a safe, fun, rewarding place. And it's not that I'm feeling like this all the time. I'm not. I'm actually enjoying life most of the time. But there is this sense that I'm seeing now that's very similar to what my mother has is just not being able to relax and see the safety in the world because it's there. It's really there. And you, you get what you focus on. You, you see it's a confirmation bias that all human brains have. Whatever you already believe, you'll see more of that. If you believe that the world is unsafe, consciously or unconsciously, that's what you'll get more of and you'll be more alarmed. If you can open to the possibility that the world is a safe place and you have a choice of directing the needle towards safety or towards danger, it's not unconscious anymore. It's not automatic anymore. You actually make the choice of looking at the world in a safer way. The more safety will come to you. But if you look at the world in an alarmed way, more alarm is just going to keep coming your way. And the only way we break down anxiety and live a healthier, more fun, more rewarding, more joyful life is to start learning to not focus so much on the negative. And I'll see you next time.